What was the day like? What was the weather like the day you found Sue? Was it rainy or windy? Was it sunny? It was foggy. You know, in South Dakota in the summer, it was never foggy. It was really, it was weird all the way around, but it was so foggy. Um, when we woke up in camp, I'd been out there with Blackface Institute looking and excavating dinosaurs for two months. And this was the end of our season. We were almost done collecting the last specimen uh, for Ceratops skull. And we were going to finish it and leave the next day. But when we woke up in the morning, there was a flat tire. And I thought, great, you guys go change the tire. You don't need me. And I've been wanting to go to this one little area we missed for two weeks. But because it was foggy, so me and my dog were set up. It was so foggy, I couldn't see the butte. It was about four or five miles away. And I said, OK, it's foggy. You're disoriented. Make sure you don't walk in a circle. So two hours later, I was back right where I'd started by the river. I could not believe I'd walked in a circle. Um, but by then, the fog was lifting. I set out again. I went right there. And just like 10 minutes, walked in the bottom of the cliff. There was a pile of scraps of bones. It wasn't hard to find there as long as you were there. And it was really large. So you found a bunch of scraps of bones on the ground. This is how we find fossils in the field. We walk around for hours at a time looking for bones on the ground. I, I got a question for some of the kids here. How does something become a fossil? What does something have to do to become a fossil? Um, first, when the animal dies, it, it becomes um, buried in sediment. And then bacteria and the minerals get into the bone and it fossilizes that. And then over the years, it, you, the sediment erodes and then you can find it. All right, so the sediment eventually erodes in these rock formations, exposing the bone. So when paleontologists go out looking for fossils, they have to look along the ground. We have to walk for miles and miles and miles to look for fossils. I've been on digs where we hadn't found anything for weeks or months. But Sue was walking around, and she was looking for bones on the ground because these fossils are usually weathering out of the side of a hill. And when the bones weather out, they crumble and they fall to the bottom of the hill. And then what happens is paleontologists are walking around and they're looking for these pieces of bone. And then when you find these pieces of bone in the ground, you have to follow them up the hill. Is that what you did? You followed it up the hill? And what did you find when you uh, walked up the hill? Well, first of all, I just looked up. And it was there, about eight feet up. I saw it too. There were five bones sticking out. And then I walked carefully up the side and inside right. the bones. I didn't want to see up the yeah. And looked at the bones. And it took me took me a few minutes to like figure it out there what was the easy part and the exciting part. There were three back vertebrae, the dorsal vertebrae, exposed and they were articulated, meaning they were still in position as in life. And they were both going into the hill at each side, so there was a good chance of more. But by looking at those, um, they were hollow bones, like a chicken bone. And when you're out looking, you know you almost never, ever, ever find any of the carnivorous dinosaurs. They're just super rare. You find a lot of the plant eaters, because they ran in herds of hundreds and thousands sometimes, kind of like buffalo. So there were a lot more of them, and therefore a lot more were preserved. But the, the meat eaters, including T-Rex, you just rarely find even a bone or part of a bone. But those three vertebrae, they were hollow bones, so I'm like, usually I just found triceratops, stuck with dinosaurs, the common ones. And I say, okay, the hollow bone must be a carnivorous dinosaur. So I'm really excited, and then the vertebrae were really, really big. And in the Lake Cretaceous, which is the formation I was collecting in, um, the only really big carnivorous dinosaur then was T-Rex. So just by extrapolating, I knew it must be a T-Rex. And at least five bones of a T-Rex, and likely more. So I picked up three scraps off the ground to take with me. The guys were by then done with the flat tire and two, three hours away working on the triceratops. So I walked over there with scraps because I knew if I went over there and said, I just found a T-Rex, it's no way, <laughs> no way. And I showed them those and I said, ah. And late in the day I took Pete over and he's a jumper and screamer. He was jumping over. I'm, I'm real quiet. I, probably said something to my dog, like, wow, look what we found. He was jumping up and down, saying, wow, it's all there, I just know it's all there, and she was. So what did you guys do next? Um, <laughs> did you excavate right away? Did you uh, get permission from the landowner? Um, how long did it take to excavate Sue? 
um, I had already requested permission to be on the ranch owner's land, and then once we realized, you know, I think we excavated a little bit, but once we realized there was more and more, then we contacted him, so he came out and saw it, and he was really happy. You know, we let him know how important it was. Um, and we started excavating, I think two days later, because we, first we finished the entire center tops, and then we were waiting for Pete's brother to come up, because Pete wanted his brother to see it before we touched it. And we didn't tell him it was there, it was like, surprise. Um, but once we started digging, it was one of maybe the fastest dinosaur excavation ever. Um, it only took us, I think it was 17 days, because it took five days to get the overburden the rock down to her level. But she was all there, she was all articulated, in, you know, about a 30 foot by 30 foot area. And so all we had to do was get down the area, clean the top of the bones, and then divide it into big chunks, big chunks. Um, and remove the rock and the bones. You don't try to prepare them in the field because it's it's very delicate work. And we found the skull was the last thing. We found everything except her head, and that's what you want to find the most. So we're like, oh my god, we've got this whole T-Rex, but no head. And you know, in the field, we were like afraid that we didn't even say skull. The only time there was any bones, they just had a skull. We didn't want to jinx it. But if we more or less given up, and then we were digging down the sides of the, the pelvis of the hip bones, um, and underneath, underneath her pelvis was her hand. And, and we were so excited, and then because it, they're so massive and big and heavy with all the rock, we wanted to separate the skull from the pelvis in the field, um, and we kept digging in, but it, literally bone was touching bone, so we had to take it as one big uh, three-ton chunk of rock. How do you move three-ton chunk of rock containing a skull on the pelvis? Um, you have to be inventive. First of all, the landowner wouldn't let us bring a truck on. You know, we had to hike out there every day carrying our supplies until the last day when we were taking out the big pieces. Then we come in with a big pickup truck, um, the pelvis and skull. All, all the pieces are wrapped in plaster jackets. And that big piece we reinforced with two by fours because we didn't want it to flex. Again, you're trying to protect the bone. And that's why you leave the rock on the bottom because that holds it in place also. And then we put, you know, plywood kind of ramp and uh, chain hoist and skid, skid it up into the truck. We weighed the truck before and after on one of those truck scales. And, you know, that was the hardest piece, but they're all hard. They're heavy. I now have a lot of back problems. <laughs> Seriously, I've had one disc out and taken the next one out in a month. <laughs> so watch out. <laughs> yes, I have to be very careful moving big stuff. <laughs> Dennis is one of our volunteers here. He's a very strong man. He's been on the field with us looking heavy blocks of rock. So Sue is a big discovery for science. Uh, it is the largest, most complete T-Rex ever discovered. Uh, just a couple of quick facts. It's about 40 feet long from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail, about 13 feet high at the hips. It is the largest carnivore in North America with the strongest bite of any animal ever to walk the earth. It had 58 teeth like this, and these are all about uh, 12 inches long. Most of it was embedded in the jaw. Part of it was exposed, but these things would lose their teeth throughout their lifespan um, and when they bit into something tasty. And right behind the tooth in the jaw would be another one waiting to come out, a lot like a, a shark. And the, what do you think T-Rexes ate? What did T-Rex eat? Meat. You think it ate meat? Why do you think that? Can I say something? Do you know what Sue ate her last meal? Does anybody know? Well, that's a good question. Tell us. Well, we found her stomach contents, so we know that she had very recently eaten a duck-billed dinosaur, which is meat. So you're right, she's a meat eater. That's one way scientists can figure out what they ate based on the other animals found with it. 